Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the IISS for this uh, discussion meeting about envisioning an end game in Syria after Afrin uh, and Sochi. Uh, the maps that we've all been looking at of the Syrian conflict, one of which behind me um, for the past six years, have, have shown territorial distribution of, uh, of the competing factions, but they've achieved much greater coherence um, of late. And external powers also, as we've seen, have become more vested. Uh, example number one there would be Turkey's recent Operation Afrin. Uh, we have parallel peace, peace processes going on in Geneva and Astana Sochi, if I can create one location from two fairly distant places, uh, and yet very little progress. So um, our senior fellow for Middle Eastern Security, Emil Hokayam, uh, who's uh, written uh, a great deal on Syria and has visited the battlefield many occasions um, over the past six years, will uh, give us the presentation today. He will assess Syria's military and political uh, battlefields, analyze the principal objectives of the uh, parties in Syria and their external patrons, um, give us a reading of the Geneva uh, negotiations in Sochi, and uh, have some speculation around possible end games. Um, there are quite slide heavy, which is why we're in here rather than on fifth floor. Emil, over to you. Um, sure. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for coming. Um, well, I'm, I'm, I have pretty bad eyesight and I'm pretty bad an, at envisioning anything, to be honest. So uh, I think this presentation will mostly be about assessing the balance of power, uh, playing out a few, uh, uh, with you a few scenarios uh, about where all this is going. I still think we're, uh, the balance of power is, uh, in, in, in Syria is clearly clarifying. Um, the regional interests of countries are also crystallizing. Uh, but I still think that we don't know exactly how uh, those the very uh, the multitude of informal arrangement and formal processes will come together to you know um, in a way solidify the the de facto partition of Syria or or perhaps actually uh, um, you know uh, uh, lead to a scenario of possible total regime control of the country and I'll actually talk a bit about how this may come to happen. I, I still think it's relatively unlikely absolute control, but it's certainly something we have to, we have to keep in mind. Um, so first, let's understand one thing, is that the conflict in Syria it continues to morph. I mean, we, we haven't reached a, a stage where, um, you know, all parties are somehow satisfied uh, with... Uh, their presence. No one has really turned their uh, their interests, their assets on the ground into a solid into solid political returns yet. Uh, they're setting the trends, and we'll talk about this. But you know, the, the game is still very uh, uh, very much in, in flux. Um, Raqqa, Hafrin, Sochi, and what they uh, symbolize, respectively. Raqqa symbolizes the military defeat of the caliphate, not necessarily of ISIS, but of the, the state-building project. Afrin symbolizes the ongoing rivalries and brinksmanship that, uh, to shape Syria's uh, map. And, and Sochi, which symbolizes an attempt to impose a political settlement on the conflict, however uh, imperfect it is. Um, those three cities and what they, they represent essentially are fundamentally interconnected, and I'm going to try to, to demonstrate uh, this. But before jumping into the analysis of, of um, recent events, uh, just some broad reminders. First, the success of the campaign against ISIS came about because it was narrowly and exclusively defined in military terms. Essentially, Politics were pushed aside, were delayed for the past couple of years. That was very much a decision of the Obama administration and then the Trump administration, um, in part because when you do that, uh, you make it easier for your military to pursue their objectives. You have a bunch of metrics that you can uh, spend your time tweeting and retweeting. Um, you know, certainly the, the Twitter accounts of the coalition and Brett McGurk do a great job at it. Um, but what, what this also means is that the fight against ISIS uh, became a guise, a, 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 a race for a territory, a vehicle for the advancement of local and regional interests. So in the process, 
those rivalries who, that were always around and certainly not the product of um, the U.S. strategy, but just, you know, sitting there, those rivalries got supercharged. And they're now exploding here and there. So, you know, uh, Iraqi Kurdistan, uh, competition in Baghdad, uh, Afrin right now, possible other explosions uh, uh, across the country. It's in part because, you know, if you fought against ISIS, um, you, you sought to, to uh, seize uh, the most valuable territory. You think that you have the ultimate uh, uh, claim the day after, depending on how much you sacrifice. So look at Iraqi Kurds or, or Syrian Kurds who say, we were on the front line from, uh, you know, from the beginning. What are we getting in return? Um, you know, those grievances uh, you know, get expressed more, so everyone ultimately feels a bit betrayed, whether it's justified or not, is, is, is different. So my point is that what we're seeing now um, is, is predictable, was predictable and expected. Uh, it's local and regional uh, jockeying on steroids. And, you know, I, I remember um, a couple of years ago, I wrote a piece um, uh, in, the, in the Washington Post uh, that basically argued that, uh, that, you know, the day after ISIS, you know, all these rivalries will, will express themselves very powerfully. The, the, the editor titled it, the end of ISIS will make the Middle East worse. And then I was accused of being a shell for jihadis. And, you know, you really don't want to find yourself in that position. Uh, but, but the fundamental point was, was, was there, that, you know, we, it's not because um, there are military advances against ISIS that somehow this is going to lead to a more uh, stable uh, uh, environment and landscape. That's why. So what I'm going to do now, and I'm, I'm actually going to stand for, for a lot of this so I can refer to, to the map behind, is first look at the Syrian battlefield um, and try to explain what's, uh, what's happening. Uh, second, I'm going to focus on Afrin and what Afrin tells us and how um, uh, this, uh, this will evolve. And third, uh, I'm going to talk uh, about, about Sochi. Now, there are two things um, that you know, I'll cover, but not extensively. Um, the first one is really Sochi and the Russian thinking, uh, because uh, Vitaly Namkin is in the room. So perhaps I can uh, uh, tempt him into sharing some of his ideas uh, about, about what happened there. Hello, Dr. Namkin. <laughs> Welcome. The second one is uh, I'm going to refer to the US strategy there. Uh, but uh, our new director for research is also in the room, and she wrote a piece two weeks ago, uh, which, I, which I wish I had uh, written, but uh, um, no, thank you. But, but the point is, is that um, you know, I, I don't want to develop U.S. thinking too much. I want to focus on regional and local actors uh, primarily. So first, the Syrian battlefield. Look, it's clear since 2015, 2016, that you know, Russia has dominance over the battlefield not absolute dominance, it doesn't pick everything and so on, but it is in charge of reg regulating the behavior of, uh, of regional actor, local actors. It has done an effort to reach out and co-opt uh, some rebel groups. It has uh, um, you know, had a complex relationship with, um, with Turkey that ha it has managed to translate into something a bit more, more tangible. Russia and Turkey and Iran and, and others have also uh, put together, um, you know, de-escalation processes, and you'll hear me talk a lot about this, and which I would describe as um, essentially a major scam, uh, but uh, a convenient uh, one for all of us to, to believe in in the process. Over the, the, the region uh, of Hama, Ghouta, Idlib, uh, uh, Dara, the south, etc. The reason why I describe this as a, as a scam is that instead of leading to you know either a comprehensive nationwide ceasefire, of course excluding ISIS and and Nusra, at least there was an agreement on this one. The de-escalation process um, and and the, the Astana process became first a way for Russia, Turkey, and Iran to manage their relations and exclude other players, involve them at the margins, etc. But these were the three fundamental uh, players uh, over this external uh, players over this battlefield. The second one, um, uh, the, the, uh, this, the, the second uh, result of Astana, or, or was or perhaps intended, is that it served as a way for the Assad regime to allocate its resources at will. So the mom, as soon as you turn that battlefield into a piece, in, into piecemeal, uh, 
you basically decide where you want to fight where with what resources. And we saw the, the Assad regime playing that game very smartly in the past year. Um, a few months ago, uh, six months ago or more, it really focused on fighting ISIS in the east and, uh, and the center. Uh, that's because the race against ISIS was happening there, so capturing crucial territory was very important. There was a race for the resort, Al-Bukamal, uh, the oil fields. Um, actually, now is a good time to, uh, to get up. Um, uh, the oil fields that are placed here. The regime didn't necessarily accomplish all what it wanted, uh, but it took part in, in, in this fight. It, it, it did get, uh, you know, it, it uh, uh, lifted the ISIS siege of the resort, it got Al-Bukamal, etc. Um, but then what the regime was able to do once that was done was to redirect resources elsewhere because in the meantime it wasn't Idlib that was under attack or, or, or the south or Ruta this is where actually the, the, the de-escalation held to route a term the past few weeks uh, have been uh, quite uh, intense um, in, in those places I'll get to, a, to it in a second um, Astana was also a way to entangle the UN into a complex, almost bogus humanitarian process. Uh, the past two months have seen almost zero humanitarian deliveries um, in, uh, in Syria. Um, you know, and, and in a way, uh, you know, linking the uh, Astana, the, the UN humanitarian process, etc., was a way to give the issue lower visibility. It was, you know, all, all, in the minds of many, at least, you know, there was something. Someone else owned that, uh, that, that mess. Astana was also a way for Western powers uh, to wash their hands off of uh, Syria. Of course, they weren't happy with a lot of what was happening there, etc. But, you know, someone else had essentially uh, 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 dominated the battlefield. Let them own it, uh, in a way. It doesn't mean that they, uh, they agreed or assented to all that. It's just that they didn't have a, a better way. Uh, they weren't ready to uh, uh, pay the costs that were needed to, to, to be in this, uh, in this uh, 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 bloody game. Uh, so essentially, we've seen that, uh, that they washed off their hands. And you know, when you look at EU statements and so on over this, um, it's, it was quite telling. Astana was also a way to co-op and split dejected rebel groups um, and, and create, you know, pretty damaging politics within, um, uh, within the rebellion, uh, which was never a unified, coherent uh, 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 actor, obviously. But the point is that it did, in the past year, um, that element of um, um, uh, fragmentation became, became even more prominent precisely because some were rewarded with the escalation in certain places so once you live uh, um, you know, without bombs falling on your head for a certain time the appetite to resume uh, fighting is very low so you basically are co-opted, you, you travel, you, you have the sense that you belong to a process um, you lose the sense of solidarity with other rebel groups operating elsewhere on, uh, in other areas. Um, so, essentially, the levels of violence uh, have fluctuated massively, uh, uh, but they're peaking right now. I mean, the past few days, the past few weeks have been really intense. Uh, the number of civilian deaths and others are increasing. Um, just to give you also uh, another uh, important metric, an IRC study that just came out uh, shows that for every Syrian uh, who returns home, there are three new uh, IDPs. Uh, so, you know, the sense that we've someone turned the corner and so on, I mean, is, is quite misplaced um, at this level. Now, let's look a bit about uh, what the, the regime has, uh, has done. So, as I said, six months ago, nine months ago, it was all about trying to seize as much territory in the east as possible. And the regime has been quite successful, not everywhere, as I said, but still, you know, secured some important access um, uh, and, and uh, you know, finally proved its credential against ISIS because there were real battles, there were real losses on this front. Uh, in the past, uh, you know, uh, regime ISIS uh, battles were quite infrequent uh, and it's 
you know, it would be pretty disingenuous to credit the regime for the mass, this massive, uh, uh, the massive defeat of ISIS. That's more due to the, the coalition, the Kurds, and, 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 and other actors. In the past two months, actually, however, the focus has been here in Idlib. You see that, uh, that zone? It used to extend all the way here. That's because um, this, uh, this highway here, the M5 highway, is a strategic spine in Syria. Uh, it's the one that goes all the way from Jordan into, into, um, into Turkey. And that territory is held by rebels some jihadi element, uh, uh, groups, uh, including uh, uh, Nusra HTS, um, a bunch of Islamists, some very extremist groups, uh, you know, the remnants of the rebellion, the, the more mainstream rebellion, etc. Uh, that territory is, is quite important because it stands in the way of uh, the regime achieving uh, total control over you know, uh, eastern, uh, western Syria. Um, and this is where, by the way, uh, the chemical weapons attacks, the chlorine uh, bombs, the uh, Khan Sheikhoun is here, etc., have, have happened. Uh, so there is a military logic to that. So people who say, uh, you know, oh, it's exaggerated and what is Assad's real incentive and so on, there is a military logic to that. Uh, this is where you also have a massive uh, regime and, and, and Russian bombing as well. So those arrows here. Uh, represent this, this effort. The regime has been successful, as I said, because you know, they essentially cut uh, western Hama province from Idlib. Um, now, the funny thing here I wanted to show is that, um, is that this uh, small, uh, I'm sorry, I'm colorblind, so I can't really uh, gray. describe that gray. Uh, this, this, uh, one of my many flaws, but certainly not. Um, uh, so so that, that uh, small area here, has been captured by ISIS, and has been captured by ISIS in the past two months. Why is that? Because essentially, ISIS uh, forces that fled Raqqa, and especially their resort, have been actually able to travel across central Syria, that uh, which you know, technically is controlled by uh, the Assad regime and its, uh, uh, its allies. And no, it's not because ISIS and the Assad regime are in bed. It shows you that the regime doesn't have the manpower, the resources to control that territory. So you have actually hundreds of fighters with their families who have actually traveled all the way to come and seize that, that area. Now, it's coming under uh, regime attack as we speak. Uh, there is uh, some significant fighting uh, happening there. Uh, that used to be rebel-held territory. So it was very funny to see um, you know, uh, Assad forces uh, um, recovering this area and then you know, within days being pushed out by, by, by ISIS. It's been tragic, obviously. But what I'm trying to say, is it shows you how fluid that battlefield remains. Um, so the regime now is really intent on capturing as much as possible of, um, of eastern Idlib. And to be honest, the way things are going, I think they have a good chance of, of uh, recovering it um, because uh, they have, of course, dominance of the airspace. Um, also because of Farfin. And what do I mean by this? Because the Turks are using rebel groups are essentially proxies in, in Afrin, uh, certain rebel groups, and I'll develop this in a second, have essentially lost all agency on the battlefield. Uh, the Turks are asking uh, those rebel groups to dispatch manpower from Idlib to send them into Afrin. So just as an existential battle is happening for jihadi, uh, Islamist rebel groups here, uh, basically Turkey is saying, no, our interests matter more, so they're actually redeploying uh, troops here, and so this is what this, uh, this other arrow um, uh, uh, shows. Um, so just to you know, continue my point on the, on the rebellion here, essentially the rebellion is strategically, militarily, politically marginal, irrelevant, crushed, whatever term you want to use. I mean, there's the, the US, uh, uh, Saudi, Qatar have essentially, they just don't see how to, to go about a military challenge there. Um, now, they certainly have a lot to blame themselves for it, but I kind of agree with that assessment. At this point, I just don't see how a military challenge uh, to the Assad regime through the mainstream rebellion uh, can be can be mounted. 
Um, and that transformation of, uh, of rebel groups in, uh, in the north in particular into full rebel, uh, Turkish proxies um, is extremely problematic because uh, those groups today are uh, behaving as absolute predators. Uh, you know, they're essentially a force for the Turks. We've seen uh, them radicalize, commit uh, many more acts of uh, abuse, violence, etc. <clears throat> now, let's talk a bit about uh, Eastern Syria and um, and the YPG, uh, the, the main Kurdish group, and, and uh, uh, that operates under the umbrella of the Syrian Defense Forces. This has been quite a successful uh, uh, um, armed group. It has obtained uh, massive uh, Western support. It has expanded its territory over the past couple of years. Uh, it controls uh, all rich provinces around here. It controls uh, uh, Raqqa, uh, other cities. You know, in Hasak and Kamishli, there is a, a joint uh, uh, control with, with the regime. So there is a, a very ambiguous uh, relationship. But essentially, they've established themselves. Um, they, they, they fought relatively well, etc. But it's now that the victory against ISIS has been declared that all the weaknesses, the exposure, the, the dilemmas of the YPG uh, come into, um, into focus. Um, now, one can say the, uh, the YPG has played its, uh, its hand well. It has captured a lot of territory, including a lot of viable territory, oil fields, cities, etc. So it's well positioned for a big negotiation. That actually, down the road, uh, if there were some you know, uh, internationally endorsed or not uh, uh, discussion over, over the future of Syria, the YPG has a lot to offer on the table and can be rewarded from. So essentially territory versus autonomy, or some form of autonomy. Uh, this is the dream of, uh, of a Kurdish, uh, a Syrian Kurdish strategist. Not everyone is on board with that. Uh, you have certain, many elements within the YPG who do have a, I would say, not in a non-judgmental way, a very uh, controlling, almost hegemonic approach to it. Say, we have to keep as much of the territory as possible because we're very exposed. Uh, the more territory we control, the more strategic we are to the Americans uh, because we are placed in, in the East where you know, our control intersects with uh, US interests in terms of containing Iran and uh, uh, contesting Assad's full control of the country, etc. Um, so that trend also exists uh, within, within the YPG. The thing with the YPG, however, is that it is relatively the weakest actor among state actors around it. Uh, the Assad regime, uh, Iran, uh, Turkey, Russia, etc. So it has to pick its battles and its alignments very, very carefully. Um, and this is where Afrin becomes uh, uh, a very revealing episode of, of all this. Uh, Afrin, this territory here, has been in a way self-governing since 2011-2012. Um, this is not. Uh, uh, this is where the YPG has had a presence. There is no American presence there. There was a Turkish one, uh, not a Turkish, a very small Russian uh, presence uh, uh, that they just left a couple of weeks ago uh, because they didn't want to be stuck there. Essentially, a lot of people, including myself, thought that their presence would serve as a tripwire uh, should the Russian, uh, should the Turks do something. In fact, I think the, the Russians are playing it smartly uh, there. They withdrew. They're waiting for the balance of power to clarify before, before taking a stand. Now, Afrin, is, in a way, is a sign of thing to, uh, things to come. But if it turns into a nightmare, it may not be a, 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 a sign of things to come, actually. Um, it, it's, quite a, it's quite an important episode in, in this, uh, this war. First, it does reflect the fraught relationship between Turkey and the U.S. I mean, I've been talking to, uh, uh, to Turks in the past, uh, the past few weeks, uh, and uh, you know, the depths of discontent and disillusion and so on is profound. Now, that doesn't mean that Turkey is going to you know, risk its relationship with the U.S. over this. I think they'll figure out uh, a way to, to dance around this. But essentially, if when you talk to the Turk, um, Turks, they basically say, we were promised that uh, uh, the YPG would not cross 
on the Euphrates, they did, they occupied Mendish. We were told that they wouldn't occupy, but they would leave Mendish, they haven't left Mendish. It's a, it's a very important Arab city here. Same thing with Raqqa. We were told that, that uh, they wouldn't control Raqqa. The first thing the YPG and the SEF did when they liberated uh, Raqqa from, uh, from ISIS is to plant a massive portrait of Ocalan in the middle of the main square where ISIS used to behead people. Uh, and then surrounded with uh, yellow flags um, uh, and, and so on. So, uh, you know, the, the Turks feel that they've been let down. Now, when you talk to American officials, they say, okay, all fine and fair, uh, but we feel that Turkey could have done a lot more and a lot sooner against ISIS, and they would have saved us from this very difficult decision that we had to make in 2015 to fully invest ourselves uh, with, with the YPA. So this is going to require a lot of uh, skill on the part of you know, Tellerson, Mattis, uh, McMaster, and, and, and others. Now, the, as long as Turkey feels that the YPG is an existential threat, I think that uh, the issue of force against, it, uh, uh, against the YPG is going to be on the table. The Turks today are talking about uh, Afrin, about Mendej, and a potential security zone along the border. This is perspective. I'm not saying that they're going to do it. I'm just going to, I'm trying to give you a sense of uh, you know, what uh, a Turkish, uh, uh, um, you know, the, the preferred Turkish scenario would look like militarily if this were the case. I think it would be very difficult to achieve. Uh, Turkey does actually occupy this area called the Euphrates Shield region with, uh, with uh, Syrian rebels. Um, but the Hafrin operation is already running into serious difficulties. Um, the, the Syrian forces operating with the, uh, alongside the, the, the Turks uh, are underperforming, and they've underperformed two years ago here. Uh, as I said, uh, they are packed with extremists. Uh, one group, for instance, in particular is uh, Han Shakiya, that has been actually blamed. I mean, it's, it's a quasi jihadi group as far as. Uh, you know, Turkey has not dedicated the level of forces that would be required for a operation <laughs> like this one, and there's a lot of discussion about why. Is it, is it because the military is still affected by the purge that followed the 2016 coup or not? Um, the terrain is very difficult. This is a m very mountainous uh, area. It's, uh, it's, uh, it started in January, it's February, it's raining, it's, uh, it's difficult. Uh, this region, the YPK has been fortifying it for, uh, for years now, uh, and they'll be able to mount a pretty big challenge against, uh, against the, the, uh, uh, the Turks. There's a, perhaps around six to 700,000 people living there, um, you know, probably half of which are IDPs, uh, but it's quite a dense territory, despite being montanus. Um, and, uh, and there's an issue, another issue. Um, the real uh, edge of Turkey, technically, should be air power. Except that this is a very densely uh, uh, militarized space uh, in which you have the Assad regime, the Russian airspace, the Turkish airspace. <coughs> the Americans are not flying there, probably drones and other things, but not uh, military missions. Um, so, you know, Turkey doesn't have full dominance over the airspace, uh, and there's Although there has been uh, um, uh, aerial bombings and some of them have caused significant uh, civilian casualties, it's not as if the Turks can deploy their helicopters, do close air support, etc. In, in, this, in this region. So unless the Turks make a much greater military investment there, I actually think this is an operation that could be extremely painful, almost fail. Um, the other thing is that as long as the Turks are focused on Afrin, the question is, can they do anything elsewhere? And you would have asked me, Mandish is easier. Um, it's, a, it's a plane. It's, uh, and the, 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 the Turks could have uh, called, they control this territory, it would have been easier, etc. Uh, I doubt that the Turks can actually conduct operations in so many points uh, at, at, uh, at the same time. So, fine, I've described what the Turkish preferred goal is. Let me tell you what I think the, the, uh, a, uh, a situation that Turkey can live uh, with 
would look like. It's actually getting the Assad regime to seize Afrin and other places. I actually think that the Turks have gotten to a position where while they had invested massively against the Assad regime in previous years, today they're willing to live with them <coughs> over the Kurds. Now, one can you know, say it's not going to happen immediately tomorrow, but I, still, I do see the, the Turks preferring that option and then rationalizing it as saying, you know, we still have the Russians, we still have Astana, we have other uh, forums and interlocutors to regulate the relationship, so let's go. Now, this is acceptable, okay? It's not the preference, but I, I do believe that uh, um, uh, this is, uh, well, I have actually indications that this is uh, in, in Turkish thinking. The other issue is that there is rising uh, discontent with the YPG domination um, in northeast Syria and other places, especially from Arab tribes. Um, you know, fine, you had the liberation of Raqqa. Um, it was great to get, uh, uh, get rid of ISIS. Uh, but then what? Who does reconstruction? Who controls governance, etc.? In some places, the, Turk the Kurds have played it uh, very smartly. In Manbij, for instance, which they control, there is a, the Manbij military ca uh, council and civilian council, and it's packed with Arabs and so on. The YPG is really in the back, I mean, you know, just has a veto right, etc., but it's not the main face. Same thing with Raqqa and so on. But let's be honest, uh, those who have uh, with muscle are not these uh, individuals, they serve them. And what you see with a lot of these individuals is they say, okay, if the choice is to be under YPG or under the regime in some loose arrangement, well, perhaps we prefer the regime. So that's how, uh, you know, when I say that the default option of a lot of actors is becoming the asset regime, uh, it shows you a bit the trajectory of this, uh, uh, this, this conflict. So there is a, a very difficult uh, um, uh, um, decision point down the road for Turkey. Is that at what moment does it decide that its military options in northern Syria are quite limited, uh, demanding, and, and so on. I mean, I don't know what Erdogan's domestic calculations are, but that's going to be um, significant. Now, what about the PYD and its calculations? Well, first, they, the PYD calculates that a strong defense of Afrin is one doable. Uh, second, will bog down Erdogan for a number of months, and that's going to be probably a very destructive battle on the level of Raqqa. I mean, you know, that, that, uh, that same. It will be in the media, there will be outrage uh, in Western capitals, at the European Parliament and, and other places, uh, so on. So, you know, you fight. You know, you, you, you're seen as the victim, you're seen as the good guy in the fight against ISIS, you hold your ground. There's no point in looking for an accommodation with, uh, with, uh, with Turkey or so on. Um, the other uh, uh, calculation of the YPG is that um, Turkey, uh, the U.S. will not allow an operation elsewhere. So essentially, you don't have to worry that much about your back. Now, that may be a totally false assumption. I happen to actually think the U.S. <coughs> will not allow this, at least in, in the foreseeable future. But what does it do? It allows you to move troops from Manbij and elsewhere through regime territory into Afrin. And this actually is happening. Now, I can't really confirm the number of troops that have been sent in the past couple of days. Uh, can you know assess some videos, some pictures, etc. I talked to some individuals. It's significant, but you know, is it enough? But the point is that this is exactly what the YPG is thinking, that they actually have a security cover from the Americans right now. And so you, you're on board with the Americans, but to militarily protect Afrin, you also have to enter a series of arrangements with the regime. So you need the regime. You have to talk to them. And you have to talk to the Russians because you, know, you really need to pass those troops uh, there. So that's one of the, uh, the dilemmas that YPG uh, 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 faces. Is that Their main ally is the US. And the US, you know, in the Tillerson speech a couple, months ago, uh, a couple of weeks ago, sorry, you know, had a pretty ambitious uh, uh, list of goals for Syria. Well, you know, 
not really a strategy, the risk appetite isn't there, there is a mismatch between uh, the goals and the resources available, and, and the U.S. is quite exposed in that territory, quite vulnerable, um, and so on. But if the U.S. is your main ally, you also know that Turkey, Russia, Iran, uh, others are way more committed, and they will outstay you if, if need be. So you can't ignore them, you have to talk to them. You have to have relations with the regime in Russia because you need to move troops, as I said before, because you need them to de deny airspace for Turkey, which they're doing. Uh, and you need them to, at times, occupy territory, if need be, or just plant a flag. So what the, what the Kurds have been asking is for the Assad regime to defend its borders, even though they kicked them out of those places. They've actually you know, berated Damascus for not defending those borders against Turkey. Obviously, the regime is not going to dedicate troops there. It's actually happy, because you essentially have two of your sworn enemies, Turkey and the Kurds, fighting each other, and their default option, both, is you. I mean, you know, it's the best of all worlds. Um, I can't believe I'm saying this about Assad, but yeah, I mean, like, um, and that's... Uh, so you need to, to, to do this. And as I said earlier in my presentation, um, down the road, you may have to exchange territory for a level of autonomy or some agreement on federalism or changing the name of the Syrian Arab Republic into the Syrian Republic and, and other things that were discussed or were supposed to be discussed at, uh, in, in Sochi. So the default option of the... Um, of the Kurds, uh, is also in some places, not, I'm not talking about a, a, a fundamental uh, change, but in some places, the regime, including, I think, Raqqa and so on. Now, this is not going to happen immediately. I think the Kurds are going to play the Americans against the, the regime and the Russians. It's going to be quite a complex dance uh, before that. Uh, but in a way, that's, the, um, uh, um, that's a very uh, likely scenario on, on the horizon. Now, while all this is happening, you have also developments in the south that are quite significant. Essentially, the eastern Ghouta, where uh, you know the, the, the town of Douma, uh, east of uh, Damascus, and so on, is coming under massive um, uh, bombing at this point, including uh, chlorine attacks and alleged chlorine attacks, and, and so on. Um, you know, there is nothing that can do be done militarily here. I mean, it's totally isolated. The game is up there. The question is, uh, how are we going to accept, justify, um, you know, a mass slaughter there? But I guess that, that question has been solved some time ago. The other one um, is, uh, is the south here, Deha. In the past couple of months, this has been a quiet area. The regime has made some gains uh, earlier uh, last year. But this is quite crucial because the regime is intent on reopening the uh, border point with Jordan. Jordan and the U.S. are essentially on board. Uh, they just need to figure out what the arrangement is. Uh, they need to patrol that region. Um, that's the difficulty, is that you still have rebel presence here, uh, and you need those rebels to deal with ISIS. There's a small uh, ISIS affiliate, uh, Khalid bin Walid, here. There's some Nusra elements there. So you're going to try, just as... Um, Turkey turned northern rebels into full proxies in the border, border guard and mercenaries, uh, an auxiliary force. Jordan has done the same thing with the rebels in the south. Now, selling them this is going to be massively, uh, massively painful. So, this is the battlefield. This is what Syria looks like. Now, the Russians and uh, President Putin, a couple of months ago, have had announced victory in Syria. I'm pretty sure you agree with me, uh, based on all this, that uh, victory is, is still uh, um, a few months or possibly years away, uh, because there is still a lot of fuel in that fight. Uh, this is not something that's going to be resolved immediately. The Russians had designed Astana and the Sochi processes. I mean, Sochi was supposed to be the culmination of that, of that process, right? I mean, you know, a formal... Uh, agree, not an agreement, but at least an understanding of what uh, the future of Syria would look like. Um, well, the Russians have been successful in some ways and have failed in others. Uh, they've been successful in defining down what we want politically in Syria. 
Uh, we're no longer talking about transition. We're not even talking about rewriting the constitution and elections. We're talking about amendments to the existing constitution and you know, with elections not necessarily being about the presidential elections and in what time frame and who can run, etc. The Russians wanted to talk on the margins about the reform of the army and you know, constituting one military and so on. Uh, I've just spent a couple of days uh, reading and watching uh, statements by uh, Assad regime officials. Um, they're, they're unhappy with the, and that's a, you know, a very polite term, uh, with, uh, with the so Sochi uh, statement. Um, so the, the Russians haven't really been able to uh, inject uh, the, the momentum, the substance into, into that, that process. I mean, look who didn't show up or, or was unhappy in Sochi. <laughs> The regime was unhappy. The HNC, the main opposition negotiating body, boycotted. Some individuals from the opposition attended on their, uh, in, their, in a personal capacity. The Kurds weren't there. There were some Kurds, but not the main umbrella groups, in part because Turkey was, uh, was uh, unhappy with it, in part because the regime was not very happy with their presence. The US, the EU, the UK weren't there. Well, they got Mistura. Um, you know, I mean, with all due respect to uh, to the special envoy, um, and you know, even if he, act in a way, tried to find a, an alignment between Sochi and Geneva, I would argue these are two failing processes. That said, I still think that overall, the Russians, because they've been able to define down what we can expect politically in, in Syria have come on, on top of that, of that process. It's not a total victory, um, it's just good enough. And in the Middle East, you know, good enough is already something uh, to, to work with. Thank you. Uh, Emil, thank you very much. It was an excellent presentation. Um, I'm sure many of us will be mulling those maps for, for uh, many hours uh, to come. Um, let me ask you, abuse my um, position and ask you one question first, which is, look at Russia's flight from Afrin um, and what that says about Russia's relations with Turkey, and then looking to the south, uh, Russia and Israel. So on, on Afrin, is there any read across from the fact that Russia didn't stand and fight there? Um, and which is a question that's come up in, in other conversations around the Institute. Uh, do you see any signs of an Israel-Russia understanding in the South? Um, sure. I mean, first, it's interesting to remember when and why Russia uh, sent troops to Afrin. Uh, I think it was a year ago, and that was um, precisely because there were concerns about Turkey pushing into Afrin. But I think Turkey at this point is so entangled uh, in you know complex relations with the U.S., etc., that the Russians don't feel as worried about Turkey as they did a year ago, two years ago, and so on. I mean, I think the the, the Russian thinking is that okay, Turkey doesn't necessarily behave as well as we expected, but Turkey is still stuck in processes that we put together. Uh, it it uh, cannot afford to totally alienate us because we saw what happened last time, especially when Turkey is saying. So essentially the Russians are giving some rope for Turkey to hang itself, but not too much. I mean, you know, I'll come to the rescue. They'll, they'll push them up. Um, so, and I don't think they ever, ever wanted to, to fight in Afrin. I mean, there were, I don't think Russia is ever going to pick up a direct fight with another state actor, um, you know, it's one thing to fight non-state actors and coerce, and you know, uh, say that's it would be a different uh, kind of escalation. You know, Russia, Israel, uh, very interesting because Netanyahu was in Moscow the day before Sochi, and then a very high-level Russian security delegation went to Israel uh, just after. So very clearly, <laughs> the Israelis are worried about the kind of security architecture that's. Uh, uh, raising. Um, very clearly, the Russians have been either unwilling or unable to really get the Iranians and Hezbollah to behave. You see where this, uh, uh, this arrow is? This is Beijing. Um, there was a, uh, a, you know, a big Hezbollah uh, regime, etc., push here just uh, months ago. 
And uh, essentially, the, the Israelis freaked out about this. I mean, it's just coming way too close to the Golan Heights, etc. So a lot of the Israeli-Russian discussion is about what, you know, a informal security zone would look like. They already have agreements. Now, the fact that Israel bombs, uh, well, they bombed it last night, Shahanma, and the SSRC, uh, uh, you know, research facility where probably chemical weapons were, uh, were built in, in Damascus. You, every few weeks you have, you know, large-scale Israeli attacks. Is that... They, they don't feel that the, the Russians are either able or willing to push the Iranians as much as they, they want. So it's always going to be a combination of Israeli coercion with Russian conflict management. Um, I personally think that you know, the, the Russians are in a very difficult spot because if there is a war, whether it's here that involves Israel, whether in Syria or Lebanon, this time, you know, phone calls are not just going to go to Washington for conflict management and escalation and de-escalation. They'll go to Moscow. Um, and is Moscow ready for it? Well, you know, the, the argument would be if they couldn't get Sochi right, I mean, how are they going to manage a war, right, in which some of their personnel will be there and so on. So a lot of expectations are in there. I still think... You know, Jordan talks to the Russians, Israel talks to the Russians, uh, well, you know, the Lebanese talk to the Russians. It, they will be a central player in all this, but they're not a, a, they're not totally in control of the game. And so it gives them some deniability, there's some ambiguity, they can always say, oh, we, re we told the Iranians not to or whatever, but you know how they behave and you can't blame us and we don't have those massive... So, I think the Russians have some, rule, uh, some room um, to justify uh, what, what they're doing and, and not what they're not able to achieve, but the pressure is going to increase on them. Thank you. Right. Open up next questions. Um, Corey caught my eye first. Could you say a little bit more about the Iranian relationship on the ground in, the, in and around Afrin and what's going on between the Turks and the Iranians? Sure. Well, the Iranians had actually a small presence uh, here, uh, just around here. It seems like they, you know, they pack their stuff. They don't want to be on the front line. Uh, I think Tehran is very concerned of being entangled in some, like, direct shootout with, with the Turks. It's not their thing. They prefer to, you know, close their eyes on what the Kurds are doing. It's, uh, so... This is not what the, the Kurds, uh, the, the Iranians would consider strategic territory right now, right? The, the, the Iranians are much more focused on the south, on Damascus, <coughs> on the border with Lebanon. Uh, elsewhere, they're there to, in, uh, to support, uh, to, um, they play support functions, uh, you know, uh, intelligence observation. They're not at the forefront. They were at the forefront last year for the fight uh, in Aleppo. I mean, where they played a, a very significant role, especially in the south, uh, in the south of Aleppo. Um, now, I suspect that you know Tehran is not necessarily very happy uh, with this, but at the same time, it sets a precedent that you can actually go after the Kurds, deny them, you know, uh, political uh, political victories. Certainly, the Iranians were quite happy with what happened in northern Iraq uh, last year. Perhaps they were even involved in some of that. Um, but look at how it turned out in, in, in Iraq. Uh, Prime Minister uh, Barzani, uh, the PUK, Kuwait Talabani, and so on, are now trying to build good relationship with, with Iran. I mean, you know, they, they basically all calculate that the Americans just don't have the staying power, the credibility, and so on. So you're actually going to use them. You're going to, you know, make deals. You're going to try to leverage them, uh, as much as possible. Um, so if you're Iran, um, you, you know that you have a much better foothold than, than the others. And it's not, it's not a strategic priority at this point. So they actually took a step back in, in, in all this. Um, they still worry about the Turks, uh, but that's not their main uh, thing. Yeah. Charles Vivian, please. I'm a member of IISS and I'm Iranian. Oh, sorry. So I want to say that uh, in Iran, the <coughs> involvement of the, uh, the Revolutionary Guard in Iraq and uh, Syria is not popular. If you ask 
from the average people. They won't say we have lots of needs in Iran. And demonstrations have shown that uh, people cried, uh, uh, give us more jobs and uh, financial <coughs> means than going to Iraq and Syria and fighting for this. So I think that the involvement of Iran uh, in the next 10 years <laughs> they can, because especially the fundamentalists, the right part of the Iran political uh, spectrum, they are they are for this uh, intervention. Whereas the medium, the Rouhani uh, regime and Rouhani government and others, they are more concentrated on the problem of Iran, and there are huge problems in Iran. There are lots of people who don't have jobs. And so on. Thank you. Um, I don't, I'm not sure I agree with you on um, the popularity of uh, the Iranian intervention in Iraq and Syria. Let me uh, explain what I mean by this. There is there's no doubt that there was a debate in Iran up 2014 about Iran's role in Syria and, and Iraq. The, the emergence of ISIS, and the fact that ISIS was such a sectarian, brutal movement and so on, has actually had an impact on elite debates inside, um, inside uh, in Tehran. But basically, people said, OK, they bought the Bush argument. You have to fight them there, so you don't have to fight them here. Um, and in a way, the ISIS frame was, has, had, has become very useful uh, for regime hardliners to justify their investment elsewhere. So before 2014, uh, the Iranians wouldn't release many pictures or uh, footage or names of the fighters who died elsewhere. Since 2014, they became mass martyrs, heroes, etc. You know, they, they fought the good fight. So at that level, at least in national security terms, I think the, the debate was over in 2014. I think the, the attack last year on the Iranian parliament also, you know, fed into, into this and, and so on. So, um, uh, number one. The, the second thing is, I do accept that there is significant popular resentment at money spent elsewhere. Um, you know, when I go to, to, to Iran uh, as a Lebanese, um, I either meet uh, pro-regime Iranians who tell me, Lebanese, we love you, we'll support your resistance, we'll go all the way, and so on, or anti-regime -Iran uh, anti Iranians who look at me and say, Lebanese, give us our money back. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> no. What I'm trying to say is that, that there, you certainly feel that, that uh, 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 you know, there, there's, they're, all, they're conflicted. The society is conflicted about this. That said, Iran is a serious strategic actor. And I don't think that the money it invests in its regional policy, in its defense policy, and so on, varies depending on, on popular mood. Uh, I wish this were otherwise, because you know, it would be good for a bit everyone. But I think this is a serious strategic actor that has prioritized all, uh, all this. They'll, they'll devote uh, that money uh, to, to what they need. So for instance, you know, uh, to make a parallel, on the nuclear program and uh, the nuclear deal, right? a, a, a big um, criticism of the deal from you know, uh, those who are critical of the deal uh, is that uh, we gave money to the Iranians and now they can pursue the regional adventures and, and so on. My point is that they would have pursued them anyway, right? I mean, that, it's, it's just made it a bit cheaper. But that's not the deciding factor. And certainly today, if you're in Tehran, you feel that you've been vindicated. Your position is very strong regionally. You have more cards uh, to play on, on, you know, uh, in, the regional, uh, uh, in the regional game. Uh, you know, even countries in the West and elsewhere say, you know, we may not like Iranian policy, but at least Iran is a competent actor, so let's get into a discussion with them. So I, I, I wish this were the case. It's, it's not. The uh, meeting was advertised at 4 till 5, uh, but I do want to have enough time for questions, so I'll run this at about 10 past 5. Next person on my list is David, please. Uh, thank you, uh, David Button, Chatham House. Uh, I mean, you mentioned um, Assad being in a kind of win-win situation, I I wonder if you could develop a little bit about how um, Assad and the regime are looking to play out um, what I think for them looks like uh, a coast up towards 2021 and the next presidential election for Assad to get uh, the next term that he's entitled to by the, by the Constitution. And in that context, um, you also mentioned 
some dissatisfaction among the regime people with some of the Sachi formulae, the way mechanisms for the constitution writing and sort of uh, agenda. Um, and finally, in that context, um, we clearly are seeing a lot of Syrian expatriate money going into Syria at the moment. And we have that's reflected in the extraordinary stability of the exchange rate, um, which, which shows that there, there are funds coming in. There's more industrial activity going on. There's, there's a lot of uh, buzz around some of the new um, urban development projects and so on. So how is this uh, expatriate Syrian money going to be harnessed, perhaps, to, to securing Assad's future? Um. You know, uh, the, the discussion, uh, uh, your, your comments uh, remind me of uh, uh, what I used to hear in 2012 and 13 about Assad's 2014 strategy. Uh, I'll send you a piece about this. But the, the, the regime is, is very conscious of the need to put on big shows of legitimacy, right? I mean, probably to compensate for actually a relative lack of legitimacy in, in, in some places. But right now, <laughs> yes, there is a build-up towards 2021. Uh, it's, it's very clear. The point is, is, is the, the fundamental point is the following. Um, you know, civilians in, in civil wars, according to Statis Kalivas, and, uh, most of them don't take sides. Most of them are fence-sitters. They're trying to survive. And, and they basically try to read... Uh, the dynamics, the winds, adjust accordingly. And when someone looks strong, then you go and embrace that someone, right? When someone can provide a sense of order in absolute chaos, even if that person has created the chaos, you still go there. So the regime understands very well that elections for it are the way to go. I mean, I, I am convinced today, if you organize elections, even under UN supervision, Assad will come on top. Because your average Syrian, even those who hate Assad, basically calculate that the international community has caved, that people are not going to challenge his rule, etc. So why, as the weakest actors in all this, should they carry that fight when they're totally exhausted and so on? So I think the regime is reading the, those dynamics relatively well. I mean, you know, I think that there is a, a strong chance of you know, Assad coming on top of even a fair election. This is, by the way, one of the reasons why I think going with elections is not enough. You know, this focus on, uh, on elections actually may backfire massively. Um, you know, I remember U.S. officials uh, trying to convince me that, uh, you know, if there were elections, all refugees are going to vote against Assad. I'm like, my point is, uh, like, no, I actually don't think that's the case. If they want to go back or whatever, they're going to sing twice. I know a lot of Syrians who will vote for Assad despite having fought him or fled him and uh, fled his regime. So they're playing that card because they know that they're likely to win it. And they will get, uh, the regime will get the legitimacy. Now, in the process, the regime still has a lot to do. Uh, the strategy of, you're talking about uh, reconstruction and real estate and so on. The regime pursued a strategy of depopulation. I don't want to use cleansing because, you know, it wasn't always the violent thing that we saw in other countries. But the strategy of depopulation in a lot of places. Assad feels comfortable ruling over a country of 10, 12, but perhaps 14 million people. But all those who rebelled and went uh, left and went abroad and so on, they can stay there. They can be a burden on neighboring countries, the international community. They're actually, it's great. They paralyze policy making elsewhere. That's essentially was his calculation. So the regime is going to essential and has already started in some of the legal decrees the, the, that we saw on real estate. So formalizing the, um, the expulsion of people from informal dwellings, uh, areas, etc., where they had been living for decades. So you think that the reconstruction in Lebanon was incompetent, corrupt, unfair, and so on? Wait to see Syria, what Syria will look like. Um, so <coughs> there is engineering at that level. Um, you ask about expat, uh, expat money uh, coming in. Yes, there is evidence of uh, some small manufacturing, I mean, manufacturing projects uh, 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 coming back online, etc. Uh, I was struck in the past few years interviewing uh, uh, Syrian businessmen. A bunch of them had packed their, their factories 
uh, dismantled and packed their factories from Aleppo into Latakia, set on them, and now are, are putting them together. So it's not necessarily all new. It's people who basically waited until they saw what was going to happen to resume production. Um, it's easier to get resources now. I mean, you know, all the, the feedstock that you need to import it than, than before. Uh, stuff is even coming in from Turkey. It's not just through the, through the ports. So it's just easier and cheaper to, to produce stuff. Uh, expat money, uh, let's wait and see uh, what is the form of these investments. I mean, are they forced to work with regime uh, 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 figures? Uh, you know, do they have to pay a cut to the regime, you know, to, uh, to, you know, in case they need to be forgiven for, you know, deserting at some point or perhaps siding with others? I mean, there's an example of a businessman who had funded uh, re rebel groups or, or even uh, humanitarian efforts were coming back to the regime, but basically they have to take a cut of 20, 25% on, on whatever they do. Anything that happens, whether it's reconstruction, humanitarian help, you know, uh, all the stuff, is going to be an instrument for the regime for its own consolidation. I mean, that's the fundamental point. It's all going to be massively politicized. So it has massive moral and political implications for whomever is going to jump into that game. Do you want to subsidize the regime's stabilization and counterinsurgency strategy or not? And the debate is going on right now. Some argue uh, in favor for purely moral reasons. Others argue in its favor, like many Europeans, saying the only leverage we'll get is if we give him money. Um, and then we can, I'm doubtful, you didn't have a leverage when uh, you know, you were fighting him, and you know he was uh, he was really weakened almost existentially. So I'm doubtful. The Americans are very clear: zero money. The French have been quite clear on that. The Brits as well, the, the Dutch, and so on. So the debate is still playing out, um, and there are the issue of sanctions. You know, European and U.S. sanctions. Um, in fact, the French and the Americans have increased sanctions on Syria in recent times. They haven't eased them. So you're going to think really hard before sending your dollars there. Professor Namkin, I don't wish to put you on the spot, but if you would like to make a contribution, it would be most oh, welcome. Next time, <laughs> next time <laughs> Professor Namkin will be here. Okay. Yes, please. Uh, two questions, if I may, Emil. Firstly, you described uh, the Astana process and de-escalation de zones as a scam. Do the Turks know this? That's the first question. Second question was you talked about the strategic investment that uh, Iran has made in Syria, and particularly in the south. Can you itemize for us exactly what Iranian interests are in Syria? Um, do, the Turk, uh, do the Turks know that? They know it, but um, it's painful. It's past dependency. You, you've rationalized a year ago that uh, you know, the, American, well, the Americans had withdrawn from the power game. Uh, you're trying to manage a rivalry with Iran. Uh, the Russians were tough on you, and you paid the cost. So, yeah. so they got in, and it's entanglement. And it's, it would be very difficult for the Turks today to come up publicly and say, uh, yeah, they got us, and we weren't able to guarantee uh, the escalation in any of the zones where we said uh, we were. In fact, we're even more entangled in Syria than we were before. So... Uh, very privately, they will show their displeasure. It's not going to be a public statement or a policy position. Um, I think they don't have another forum um, to, to, manage, uh, to manage here. The Iranian investment, well, it's quite significant. And uh, you know, there's a lot of debate among us uh, observers of Syria, Middle East uh, analysts, and so on, about what it means, uh, you know, how it plays out. The first thing I would say is that Iran has overseen the development of a, uh, transnational, a transnational Shia legion that cannot be underestimated. Iran has built a network of militias that extend from Pakistan into Lebanon that are battle-hardened, have command and control, logistics, ideology, I mean, uh, that is incomparable to anything we've seen. I mean, uh, sorry for the bad... Uh, um, uh, comparison, uh, you know, uh, analogies are always self-serving, so I want to make just a sp specific point. I compare them to ISIS, 
compare this array of, of militias to ISIS, and ISIS doesn't compare, essentially. Uh, they have more uh, 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 sources of funding, uh, better social uh, uh, um, presence, uh, backed by a state. I mean, you know, so the Iranians have invested, and, and that's going to be a key driver of conflict in, in the region. Um, you know, when, um, uh, was it Ghazali or uh, Mohandes uh, who went to southern Lebanon? <laughs> I just forgot uh, the, the uh, um, An Iraqi Shia militiaman, one of the most notorious, uh, showed his face on the Lebanese Israeli border just two months ago, two, three months ago. Um, that's an Iraqi Shia leader whose forces were also present uh, in the fight against the Iraqi Kurds. So, what I'm trying to say is that they're quite mobile, they operate over a very wide space. Uh, I was telling someone that this. Uh, Hezbollahis are uh, are not the largest contingent. The Lebanese Hezbollah fighters are not the largest contingent in Syria, uh, but they took the most casualties. But Afghans are the second largest and uh, the, are the largest, but they took the second largest amount of, of casualties. The Pakistanis are high on the list as well. Uh, in June 2016, uh, sorry, 2017, Hassan Nasrallah, the head of Hezbollah, gave a speech to a very anxious Lebanese population and told them. Don't worry about the next war. You know, when it starts, we'll be able to call on tens of thousands of fighters from, and he starts listing Afghanistan, Pakistan, Iraq, Yemen, and everyone is, you know, hyperventilating over this. But that's the reality of, of that battlefield, right? I mean, the second point, and a lot of people, I think, underestimate this point, is this notion of territorial continuity. A lot of people tell me, but the Iranians used to send, uh, uh, you know, uh, weaponry to Hezbollah in the past two planes. Well, when you control roads, it's cheaper, it's more difficult to interdict, it's more difficult to actually see it on the ground. You need a much broader intelligence uh, uh, um, uh, network and you know, deployed capabilities. Uh, you're, you're more mobile, I mean, it's just that capacity that the Iranians are developing. And today it's not like a continuous uh, uh, land bridge, right? I mean, it can be inter interdicted at, at times, but it is in the making. For the Iranians, strategically, look, in the next war, their, their ally, Hezbollah, is not just going to be fighting on one front, it will be fighting on two fronts. Israel, the Israeli army, the, uh, what is it, the dome uh, anti-rocket system and all this thing, they're going to have to cover more than twice the, uh, the, um, the, the territory. And the, so it's massively uh, uh, problematic. And then... You know, you operate in highly internationalized space as well, right? For the Iranians, it's problematic because at times, you know, perhaps the Russians are passing on intelligence to the to the Israelis. Can you trust these guys, etc.? At the same time, it serves as a cover, right? Israel itself has to think about how it can conduct escalation, precisely because the space is, is so dense. I, th I think the Iranians, you know. Again, they're strategic actors. Um, they're good at doing bad. Uh, that's what we're uh, saying. They're, they're building lo those logistical ties. Um, by our count, 15 Iranian generals have died in, in Syria. Um, you know, they were committed. It shows that they were committed to the fight. They were on the front line. They, you know, ate the bad food that soldiers eat and, uh, and were present and so on. It does make a difference. Being visible, being on the ground, shows a level of commitment to local communities, even those that are opposed to you, that don't compare to some FOB somewhere that no one sees in which you operate drones, hit, and come back. The Iranians are embedding themselves into, into these, these areas, um, and they play the game well. Um, you know, I remember when people used to tell me, Syria is going to be Iran's Vietnam. I'm like, no, not at all. The strategy, the approach is fundamentally different, um, and they're coming on top of it. And the aim is Jerusalem. <laughs> <laughs> I'll pass on that one. Yes, please. Please, yeah. yeah. So my question is specifically related to the Turkish military advancement. The brunt of the Turkish forces is made up of uh, German Leopard 2 tanks, and mm -hmm. their underbellies are known for being very weak. Now, as you explained, that the area is highly mountainous. That means low heavy armor mobility and high use of ex uh, improvised explosive devices. 
So if uh, the German, uh, I mean, if the Tur Turks have difficulty using their armor, uh, if they can't use their airplanes in a highly contested airspace, and they can't shell, um, you know, densely populated areas, what are the Turkish options then? Well, I mean, you're you're putting your finger on on the military dilemma that the Turks are are facing. Uh, since the purge and since what happened within the, the Turkish military, I think the Turkish capabilities are have been affected. Uh, you mentioned the Leopard tanks. I think uh, the Turks have lost maybe 10 uh, during the Euphrates shield operation here precisely because of that. They were very vulnerable to IEDs uh, and so on. Um, they are negotiating, and I think part of that deal has been agreed with the Germans for you know, upgrades against this. But if the Germans want to, if, if there is an uproar in the West about, against uh, Turkey for the Afrin operation, perhaps Germany will not fulfill that. That's, that would be an indirect way of, uh, of signaling discontent. Yeah, you wanted yeah, to? That's, that's, that's already failed. Yeah. The deal has failed. Thank you. You're, I, I don't know the difference between an AK-47 and an M-16, so you know, <laughs> I, I don't follow the fencing. But, but I actually was curious early on about, uh, about this. Uh, so there are ways you can actually signal discontent and uh, um, to, to the Turk. Uh, yeah, you're right. If armor is exposed, if you don't have control of the airspace, if you don't have the, 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 the numbers on the ground to take it and so on, it's going to be a very painful uh, one. And then if you end up causing massive civilian casualties um, while your goal is to fight uh, terrorists and the you know, YPG thing, and so you, you're going to lose the battle for narrative. Um, now, look, there, has, there is actually very serious urban warfare within Turkey right now, I mean, as you know, and a number of cities, Sor and others, have been massively affected by, by this. So the Turks, I think, if they can justify the fight on strategic and political ground, they'll do it. Um, the, the, the other thing, and that's where actually I was a... One, Probably the reason why they didn't go to Menbej first, there are several reasons, but one of them is because the Americans are present there. So they didn't want to escalate against the Americans here in Menbej, right? I would have said it would have made more sense from a military perspective to take Menbej rather than Afrin. Um, you know, they, they picked the worst time. I mean, you know, the middle of the winter when it's raining and so on. Uh, everything I'm seeing, pictures, videos, uh, saying, it shows you that the Turks are probably not going to succeed, um, you know, as as easily as they thought. Yes, please. Yes, I'm Sergei from Turkish Embassy. It seems that I'm a bit unlucky to be here. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, but, but you're welcome. No, it's, it's, it's my honor and pleasure to listen uh, your presentation. Uh, which is, I'm afraid, uh, I do not agree uh, with most of the parts, but it seems that maybe we can make a, a, one event together uh, to uh, see both discourse, uh, to see the, uh, some real points. I guess, uh, sorry to say that, but some missing points uh, about the YPG is a terrorist organization, a strong organic ties with the PKK and the PKK which is proscribed terrorist organization in the UK, uh, US, and uh, EU. Of course, there are lots of things uh, to make a bit corrections, but I don't want to go into details uh, of thousands of terrorist attacks from the Afrin region and this Operation Olive Branch uh, specifically for uh, our border security. But uh, I'm afraid you are a bit victim of uh, the black propaganda of the terrorist organization about civilian casualties, uh, because uh, maybe we are, uh, I mean, our uh, relevant authorities announced that it's, it's going as planned, and I guess this is my personal evaluation, it can be a bit faster, but the uh, civilian, I mean, we are, we are very uh, careful about the uh, civilian issue, and so it takes time to uh, go inside of the region. Uh, and. Having said that, I would like to ask a question about uh, what is your evaluation about the relation between YPG and PKK, terrorist proscribed terrorist organization. And also, there are lots of reports uh, from the cities under the control of YPG and the local Kurdish people, the owner of the cities, they are protesting against YPG due to its uh, YPG's uh, 
human law, uh, how can I say? Uh, I, I, I got stuff. Uh, hegemony. Yes, yes, the hegemony uh, and also some undemocratic uh, procedures of the YPG there. Thank you. Certainly. Uh, look, in, in my book, the YPG is PKK. I mean, I just, there's some marginal differences, but I don't think they are operative differences. Uh, and that was always the heart of the problem for the Americans um, to to justify the the saying. I think, uh, uh, I mean, you, there was this this incident. Uh, this uh, American general, the head of the special forces, who was on tape, uh, you know, talking about his own negotiation with the YPG and saying, uh, "Okay, you have to fix something because the Turks aren't going to be mad at us." And then the next day, the YPG comes and says, "We're going to call ourselves the Syrian Democratic Forces." Uh, great, fine. You have democratic in it. Now we can work together. So at that level, I'm, I'm, I'm entirely. I don't have any illusions about the YPG. I'm actually very worried about uh, the the perception of the YPG generally. I mean, this notion that they are uh, progressive and they're female fighters, so that you know, like you know, they're creating that buzz uh, uh, that that is uh, quite catchy for a number of audiences. But it's it's it's, it's quite uh, disingenuous to say to say the least. Um, and you know, I've talked to a lot of people in Rojava and so on. There's, including among uh, Kurdish ranks, uh, a lot of uh, discontent, if, if not hatred, of, of the YPG. Uh, you're talking about a like a Marxist c communal group with quite incredible ideas of social reforms. I mean, it's just it, it, it's quite something. And and that for me is why like you know, strategically for the Americans to think that that's a partner for the long term in containing Iran and what is, it's just very problematic. There is certainly an issue of strategic dissonance uh, there. Uh, that said, when it comes to, uh, to Turkey and the YPG, look, fundamentally, had the Turks uh, been better in 2014, 2015 in terms of fighting ISIS, I think those dilemmas would not have existed. And I think, you know, the Turks just dragged their feet. They, uh, there was, and again, I'm a very harsh uh, critic of, of um, the strategy of uh, the, the Obama policy on Syria at times. I think they, they totally dropped the ball and, you know, instead of taking the conflict seriously and so on. So you won't hear me uh, defend them too much. But my point is that the opportunity for, for Turkey to be the key strategic actor and work with its people was back in 2013, 14, 15. As soon as the American war machine started and looked for partners, etc., you can be sure that the Pentagon was going to justify you know, this relationship and strengthen it in every possible way. And I, I have to say, it's, it was a problem of statecraft in Ankara, very largely. You know, they, they were well positioned to uh, to avoid this mess, um, you know, again, you know, another miscalculation, this time by the Turks, before the Americans or the Saudis or with everyone in that, in that case. Final question, and it will be to the point, as will be the answer. Ivoni, please. Um, thank you, Neil. I was just wondering if you could elaborate a bit more on your indicators as to why the U.S. will not allow the conflict to spread from the frame elsewhere. Um, I think, look, I, I, I do believe that the Americans at this point are committed to their presence in, in northeast uh, Syria. It, it, will, it will take much more than this for the Americans to, to, uh, to reconsider. I, 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 really, I see the Americans, for instance, negotiating an arrangement in which the YPG uh, draws down troops from Menbej and transfers authority to others. So the Americans will play a role in conflict de-escalation. Uh, I don't see them allowing uh, uh, large numbers of uh, uh, Kurdish, uh, sorry, Turkish troops into into this area. It's a, it's also a very large area. I mean, look at the security zone. And the point is that you know, as as the Turkish uh, diplomat uh, mentioned, uh, I should have mentioned this earlier. Saying, but. Uh, you know, yes, there were attacks from Afrin. There were also Turkish bombing of Afrin in, in, in the past. But second, if you're going to carry the fight to the east, I mean, that's a very long border, right? I mean, you have to be able to border, to, to monitor this entire region. Fine, you, they built a wall and so on. I'm not sure the, 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 the Turks are ready 
for you know, counterinsurgency operations and so on over such a long border when they're fighting in Afrin and inside Turkey at the same time. So I think it's a problem for resources also on the, the, the Turkish side. Yeah, it's all going to be a combination. But the Americans don't want to be stuck between a NATO ally and their local partner in, in, in that sense. So if they're going to spend capital somewhere, I suspect it's, it's here. Um, you know. But then there's the bigger issue of the American presence there and how vulnerable it is. And I would argue the Americans are quite vulnerable in northeast Syria. 2,000 troops in, you know, with a massive mandate and, and so on, I just see it as out of sync with, with, with reality. So this is going to show some of the dilemmas. Uh, and then it's cumulative. The, the Americans will face other dilemmas as times go by, and then they may decide to just pack and leave. Okay, thank you very much. I think we have enough material for a Syria Endgame lecture series rather than just one. Maybe we can attend to that over the next few months, but please, for now, join me in thanking Emil.